completely removed by powerful people at one point in time. This book is known as the Book of Enoch. This book is genuinely only for the prepared mind. It goes through the origins of demons, of the origins of Nephilim, why angels had fell, why God decided to flood the earth in a prophetic message that was basically that was saying a savior is coming and he's going to reign for thousands of years if you're at all a critical thinker you have to ask the question like what are they trying to hide from us why did they take it up? why did they remove this book from the bible like i this is information that you have to know right so if you guys want to go on a journey and you want to get this information you want to find out the truth just like i did i linked the book to this video guys you can get it right here and check it out for yourself the book of enoch is an ancient jewish text traditionally attributed to enoch the great-grandfather of Noah. This pseudepigraphal work is not included in the standard biblical canon of any major Christian denomination, but holds significance in certain Jewish and Christian sects. The book details complex themes of angelic hierarchy, divine judgment, and mystical phenomena, offering a narrative about the origins of evil and the fate of the universe. Enoch is a patriarch mentioned in the book of Genesis as the seventh from Adam and the great-grandfather of Noah. He is noted for his righteousness and piety. According to Genesis 5.24, Enoch walked with God, then he was no more because God took him away. Hmm. This cryptic passage has led to much speculation about his role and fate, which the book of Enoch expands upon depicting him as a mediator between the divine and human realms and a scribe of the celestial order. In the Book of Enoch, the Watchers are a group of angels tasked with watching over humans on Earth. However, they eventually fall from grace by becoming too... Is Amir, do those so-called Watchers favor those so-called Anunnaki that uh, a lot of people be talking about? You know what I'm saying? Hey, y'all still be getting me with that, but y'all gonna learn the origin of that right now. ...involved with human affairs. They teach humans forbidden knowledge such as weapon making, cosmetics, and sorcery. And they father children with human women. These children are known as the Nephilim. The Don't they kind of remind y'all of the uh, Anunnaki teaching the... Sumerians, you know what I'm saying, or ancient Mesopotamians, those fallen angel techniques, you know what I'm saying, the makeup and how to work with the metals of the earth and all that stuff and astrology and all that. You're going to find out more, y'all. Nephilim are described as the offspring of the sons of God, the watchers, and the daughters of men in Genesis 6, 4 and the book of Enoch. These beings are depicted as giants or mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Their presence on earth is characterized by chaos and violence, which ultimately leads to divine intervention. The Book of Enoch portrays the Watchers as being initially well-intentioned, aiming to assist humanity. However, their teaching of forbidden knowledge and procreation with humans is seen as a transgression against divine commands disrupting the intended order and balance of creation. In some modern interpretations and alternative histories, the narrative of the Watchers and the Nephilim is connected to the Anunnaki, gods of Sumerian mythology. The Anunnaki from the planet Nibiru also came to Earth and created humans. The Flood Myth, which appears in the Epic of Gilgamesh and is paralleled in the story of Noah's Ark, is interpreted as a deliberate act by the Anunnaki to purge the earth, including the Nephilim, by letting Nibiru's gravitational forces cause a great flood. Midst Hermon, a significant mountainous region on the borders of modern-day Lebanon, Syria, and Israel, is mentioned in the Book of Enoch as the location where the Watchers descended to earth. It is traditionally regarded as a sacred place, symbolizing the gateway between the divine and the earthly a fitting site for such celestial interactions. The connection between the Book of Enoch, the Nephilim, and the Anunnaki weaves a narrative that spans multiple ancient cultures and mythologies. It suggests a shared mythos or a common interpretative thread among ancient peoples about divine beings influencing human history, either through direct intervention or through the offspring they leave behind. 
this blend of mythological and religious texts with modern interpretations challenges our understanding of ancient history and the boundaries between the celestial and terrestrial realms. Man, y'all see how they twisted that up, you know what I'm saying? The people that talk about the Anunnaki, they twisted the story up from the Watchers, man. They try to tell you it's the other way around. It was the Watchers twisted. It was twisted up from the Watchers to the Anunnaki. But the Watchers are the fallen angels that God was talking about. And these people tell you that the fallen angels created us and all that, or the Anunnaki created us and all that, you know what I'm saying? That's... Hey man, that's a misleading misinformation in my eyes, man. They trying to take you away from the most high. Never fall for the boo-boo, man. Let's go. They tripping, man. Y'all follow that show us some love. There's a chance the book of Enoch is revealing the truth. According to what we now know, the Book of Enoch was suppressed in the 4th century because it did not accurately reflect the ancient scriptures. What if this isn't the case? What if it was because it accurately depicted human nature? In the book, it is explained how a group of angels known as the Watchers started rebelling against God and started teaching people things they weren't supposed to know, such astrology and how to make nuclear weapons. They started lying to human women in addition to doing that, which led to the creation of the Nephilim. Others claim that the book is untrue, yet given the descriptions of how the earth was formed, the positions of the sun and moon, and even the current whereabouts of the Watcher Angels, perhaps. You may not believe it, but in the forbidden book of Enoch, fallen angels desecrated themselves, turning from God and taking human wives. Enoch 612 and it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angles, the children of the heaven, saw and lusted after them and said to one another, Come, let us choose a use wives from among the children of men and beget us children. Anak 7, 1. And all the others together with them took unto themselves wives and each chose for himself one. And they began to go in unto them and to defile themselves with them. Anak 7.11 And the women conceiving brought forth giants. Like and subscribe for more. This one truth about the book of Enoch is going to blow your mind. And you're going to realize how far the deception goes. Check it out. And before you say anything bad about the book of Enoch, the book of Jude in our Bible references the book of Enoch saying that he prophesied these things. In fact, the book of Enoch is in the oldest Bible, the Ethiopian Bible, and that Bible contains 88 books. So then the question is, why isn't it in our Bible? The Bible that we have today is the canonized version. That just means the Catholic Church and popes came together and decided what books went into our Bible. Yeah, that's not a red flag at all. For real though, and notice that he said the canonized Bible, canonized, Canaan, Cana, yeah, you get it, Canaan, Cain, you get it, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Nevertheless, the oldest Bible contains it, so I'm gonna go with the oldest. Disclaimer: There are a bunch of fake book of Enoch's out there, so if you're going to research this book, make sure you do your due diligence and get the right book of Enoch. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man return. And Enoch accurately describes what happens in the days of Noah. So why is it not in our Bible? Watch these Christian movies on Tubi. Subscribe and follow. The book of... Hey, I don't know about y'all, but the way things going right now, all the gene manipulations and, you know what I'm saying, gene splicing and stuff like that going on right now, you know what I'm saying, cloning and everything. Hey, I, I I would just I would think it was the days of Noah right now. If not, shit, it's fit to be pretty soon. If you ask me, let me know what you think down below in the comments. Enoch holds the truth that has been hidden from Christians, although we've been informed that this is the vision that no other man will see, as described in Enoch chapter eight, verses one to four where the fallen angel Azazel taught forbidden knowledge to mankind. After engaging in forbidden unions with women, Azazel brought wickedness to the earth by teaching man the art of crafting weapons, swords, armor, and shields. 
resulting in the destruction of God's creations. Moreover, Azazel shared wisdom about different metals, including the use of antimony, a metallic element used in medicine. Lastly, he educated women in the beautifying of their eyelids, bringing forth much fornication and corrupting the hearts of men. As a consequence of his betrayal, God commanded the angel Raphael to bind Azazel, confining him in darkness within a desolate desert covered by jagged rocks. While awaiting his impending fiery judgment, the destructive knowledge Azazel taught continues to plague the earth to this day. It says, Y'all see that, man? The stuff that we was taught way back then, our ancestors, you know what I'm saying, the people who was before us, it still trickled down to us this day. You know what I'm saying? It's still in our bloodline. It's all around us, our society. Everything. The women, the beautifying of the faces, us, the men going to war. You know what I'm saying? We like our war weapons and all that, you know, guns and all that stuff. All that come from them, man. You know, it's all been... What they say, there's nothing new under the sun. Basically, man, that's what I'm getting at. Like, come on, man. Like, we still on the we still on the same little turn wheel doing the same thing, man. What are we gonna do? Not to make graven images of anything in heaven. That's one of the commandments, you know. Not making these graven images of things in heaven. Well, he called the firmament heaven. He put the planets up there. We call them planets. They're not really planets. They're the chiefs of the stars. And when you read like the Book of Enoch, it has a prophecy about them. It says they're going to leave their orbital paths and task. Everything was prescribed a path at creation that showed us the appointed times and when things were happening. That's how they knew when the Messiah was coming. They've always had people studying the stars. But it says the chiefs of the stars, the ones that we call planets, will leave their orbital paths and a generation to come, a generation of sinners, will err in their understanding about them and take them to be gods. And every single one of them is named after a god, except for earth. And what was earth? Dry land. God called dry land earth. Not the seas, not the world. There's the world, which is everything, the firmament, you know, the whole world, the waters. But earth is just dry land. And so it's, it, it's a prophecy that would have helped if people would have kept that book they'd have understood it that was going to come but that book was hidden for years and years and years and it says at the very beginning this book is for a generation to come in the end times so it's like one of those that when you read it everything makes sense why we've been lied to who's been lying to us you know and why yeah and that's the thing that's the that's the big that's the most important question to answer is why and it's that spiritual aspect of it no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore let no man glory in men.
checking out the firmament in this one, 1953 now. In the investigations, two instruments designed by V.G. Fezenkov were used. One of these was a visual photometer of the daytime sky intended for measuring the brightness of the firmament and derived, get this now, on the assumption of a flat earth so the Russians are trying to check out the firmament based on assumptions of a flat earth in 1957? Man, I'll tell you one thing, though. Uh, if, if this footage is real and everything that they've been saying is real, you know, in these clips so far, man, hey, it kind of makes you wonder why they, uh, you know, would take this out and say that it ain't, you know, it ain't real or it's not, you know, reliable, you know, text, as we would say, you know, like, I I guess, you know, it make a lot of sense, but it's only going to get better. So if you was thinking about leaving, I'm, I'm telling you, you definitely going to miss something that you're going to want to hear or see. Man, let's go. Let's get it. y'all think about that clip down below man y'all think that footage is real or is it look cap you know what i'm saying let me know what y'all think though okay for all of you in the comments who want to know where in the book of enoch it said that the moon would change its path here you go these roman numerals translate to chapters 79 through 83 sections 3 through 5 it's laid out a bit differently than a traditional bible is And the moon shall alter her order and not appear at her time. But other translations, actually the first translation says, and the moon shall alter its path. I have read the book of Enoch 16 times. So if you have any questions, I hope that I can answer them. Just leave them down in the comments below. Thanks for watching. I don't know why you had to say 16 times, man. But hey, that's cool, though. I'm glad you read it. But man, doesn't that kind of ring a bell, though? Talking about the path of the moon and it's not going to be in its regular order. Because here lately, the moon has not been mooning, as a lot of people would say. <laughs> Let me know what y'all think about that down below the comment section. Did you know the sun and moon have names? And those names have a secret code that you need to know? This is from the ancient book of Enoch. Let's check it out. The sun has two names, Aryares and Tomas. Aryares comes from the Aramaic root Yare, which means fear. So when you put the R in front, it seems like it could mean fear not. The name Tomas means twin. The moon has four names, possibly having to do with the four quarters. The four names are Asonia, Ebla, Banes, and Ere. Asonia means light, but it means wisdom in every language. Ebla means shameless or without shame. Banes comes from Bena, the Hebrew word for wise. So again, with the wisdom. 
Ere comes from a focus on Ja. It's where we get the word aroused from. It's an intense focus. Now let's put them all together and see what the secret code is. The secret code kind of reminds me of the yud Hey vav Hey, which means hand, behold, nail, behold. Seems pretty clear. So what the wise moon is saying every night, focus on Yah, wise, without shame, wise. And every morning the sun is looking at you saying, fear not, twin. Fits right in with the scriptures where it says that God's mercy is made new every day. With the newness of every sun, his mercy is made new for you. And every night he sends wisdom in the form of dreams to keep men from the pit. It's the same message the sun and moon are telling you every day. The sun and moon are also fascinatingly caught up in this quantum entanglement bit, this cosmic dance that has a story and a message. And they also have their own unique message, taking their own unique journeys through the Mazaroth. Stories upon stories, layers upon layers. This cosmic dance of quantum entanglement is replayed through the man and woman relationship. Men have a 24-hour hormonal cycle, and women have a 28-day hormonal cycle, just like the sun and moon. So everything that happens to the course of the woman hormonally over the course of the month happens to a man every single day, just like the sun and moon quantum entanglement, which has been scientifically captured in this picture here. And as you can see, it's the yin-yang. It's the geocentric, F-E-ish, Taurus field realm model doing the cosmic dance that Enoch describes. Quantum entanglement, by the way, is when a single particle splits and a separate but yet still maintains a link, able to communicate in some kind of way. Separated by distance, but still together, still connected, still able to communicate. This is where the telepathic communication comes from. It's also the idea of the Akashic Records, or if you're quantum entangled with somebody, there is some sort of communication that exists that's beyond the level of scientific explanation at this point. Also with the Fear Not Twin, there's a whole deeper layer there of the Bride and Christ. Man and woman, Bride and Christ, and twins. That's what's displayed with the Gemini. That's one of the stories of the Gemini Twin Constellation. What a beautiful message, God calling you twin. Enoch drops other esoteric secrets about the heavenly order. The angel Uriel is in charge of all of it. The sun and moon are the same size, and the sun is seven times brighter. They all Mario Kart checkpoint through 364 stations above. And they all go through the gates and portals I covered in my last video about the wind. There's specifically 12 windows inside the east portal alone. Also, there's four spirits in charge of the intercalary days. That's what you know as the two solstices and the two equinox days. And they're big bosses that do big things on those days. Also, the sun and moon ride a chariot that are driven by the wind. The wind has lots of jobs. Also, the length of day and night are solely based on the sun and its course, which Psalms and Ecclesiastes also go into. The 364 stations I mentioned that they Mario Kart checkpoint through is also the deck of cards or a turtle's back. 13 times 28, 364. This is the one-year cycle, which is part of another grand cycle, which is part of another grand cycle. The deck of cards, by the way, is 13 cards times four suits, which is the 13 months and four seasons, and it equals 52 weeks, or 52 cards. All this stuff is based on the sun and moon. One final mystery to ponder, this winged disc symbol, which we'll be getting into, and also the final mystery of the moon, where the craters seem to be facing us. We only ever see one side of the moon, and those craters seem to be facing directly at us. Did they come from here? See you next time. We'll have the truth. Hey, that's, that's something to think about, about the craters always facing us on the same side. It's always facing us. I thought all of us was like spinning, you know, not just Earth. I thought the moon was spinning too. But hey, what do I know? I don't work for NASA, right? Let me know what y'all think about that clip down below in the comment section. The old boy know what he's talking about? Or is he just yip yapping? Let me know what you think. Enoch 105 to 11 after a time, my son Methasala took a wife for his son the Mac. Enoch 105 to 2 to she became pregnant by him and brought forth a child, the flesh of which was as white as snow and red as a rose, the hair of whose head was white like wool and long, and whose eyes were beautiful when he opened them. He illuminated all the house, like the sun, the whole house abounded with light. Enoch 105 to 33. And when he was taken from the hand of the midwife, opening also his mouth, he spoke to the Lord of righteousness, and the Mecca's father was afraid of him, and flying away came to his own father Mathesawa. And he said, I have begotten a son, unlike two other children, he is not human, but resembling the offspring of the angels of heaven, 
is of a different nature from ours, being altogether unlike to us. Enoch 105 to 425, for his eyes are bright as the rays of the sun, his countenance glorious, and he looks not as if he belong to me, but to the angels five I am afraid, lest something miraculous should take place on earth in his days. Enoch 105 to 66, and now, my father, let me entreat and request you to go to our progenitor Enoch, and to learn from him the truth for his residences with the angels. Makeup is forbidden by God. Let me stop there right quick for y'all who don't know or understand. No, when Noah was born, his father was scared because he was so bright. He didn't look like him or them. He was so bright, you know, from what they say, they said no, and them was black, fair colored people. Remember, they are in Africa, y'all. Okay, uh, yeah. And he was uh, so bright, you know, think of albino, albinism, you know what I'm saying? Uh, bright with white hair, you know, like albino, you know, hair like wool, like a sheep, like wool. Get it? You got it? Yeah, like curly. Yeah, and eyes, like how albinos have, like, I guess red eyes, you know, they all have some kind of different color eyes, but like not normal eyes like everybody else is what I'm saying. And, uh, y'all know what I'm getting at. Y'all know what I'm getting at, though, but like uh, his dad was scared of him because of that, though. But let me know what y'all think about that down below, man. Is that, you know, is that a little crazy, y'all, or do y'all think he was part alien? And you knocky, let me know what y'all think. I'm not telling you not to wear makeup, but I want you to know the history of it. The word glamour actually means to cast a spell on someone. That's why when you do your makeup, you use a brush, which is actually called a wand. And when you rub it on your face, you turn it into something different. Look at this picture. Uh, this guy did not used to look like this before he started wearing glamour or makeup. Look at the definition. The original definition of glamour is actually magic. That's why you see for definition number two, it says enchantment or magic. It's the archaic version or the original version of what glamour means. And in the book of Enoch, angels actually came down to earth to teach women how to use makeup. And this is what it says. In the book of Enoch, it says the fallen angel, Azazel, taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates, made known to them from the metals of the earth and the art of working them in bracelets and ornaments and the use of antimony and the beautifying of the eyelids if you read the book of uh, Ezekiel where it talks about Jezebel it also mentions the beautifying of eyelids that is because it makes you look better than you actually do it's transformation it's uh, a ritual basically it was taught by angels hmm ladies Ladies, ladies, all my females out here, my female subscribers and supporters, get in the comment section. Let me know what y'all think about that. The truth about mermaids is way darker than you think. As many of us know, mermaids are humanoid creatures that are half human and half fish. But not many people know that mermaids were actually mentioned in the Bible. In the book of Enoch, it states that angels in heaven wanted to have wives like the men on earth. And due to this, they were vanished from heaven. And when these fallen angels arrived on earth, they started to have kids with women and create families. And these women that bared the children of the fallen angels were given the punishment of becoming the first ever mermaids. Their punishment was to be turned into underwater monsters known as sirens. And these women were bound to the deepest parts of the ocean for being the wives of fallen angels. Tales about these mermaids date back all the way to the 14th century where it was said that sailors would be lured by beautiful women that would later turn into hideous monsters that will drown the sailors. But what do you think? Are mermaids real? What y'all think? Let me know. It's good.
Yo, what? man, that's not the whole story, man. You know they omitted some parts out, and you know they put their own little two cents and word in it, man. The, the Bible has been edited, I don't know how many times, man. Like, come on, man, for everybody know that. So how could you think that it's the whole, the whole, you know, the whole story, like the whole everything that's supposed to be in it, like everything. Like, Giants were petrified after the Great Flood. There are several mountains and islands that seem to look too humanoid to be random formations. There is even a movie called Moana, where there was an island that was a sleeping giant woman. We all know of the story about the Nephilim giants in the Great Flood. People say, if there are giants why haven't giant bones been recovered? Well they have, but not mere bones, but entire petrified Nephilim bodies. When these giants were wiped out they became petrified and are seen all over the world yet mistaken for mountains and islands. The giants were indeed that huge. The Book of Enoch describes giants as being 450 feet tall. Just so you can put the size of these behemoths into perspective, here is a photo of a man next to a 500-foot statue called the Statue of Unity in India. This statue is around the same size as the actual Nephilim giants and a full adult male isn't even taller than its toe. These giants were so tall that they could easily be mistaken as a mountain once petrified and vegetation grows around and over them. Here are the fun. Dang, y'all boys must forgot about uh, old Jack and the Beanstalk, man. <laughs> hey, uh, where you think they got the story from? Exactly. The profound secrets the Book of Enoch reveals, and the reasons why the church wanted to erase it from history. One, Enoch's communion with divine beings challenged the church's authoritative interpretation of the divine-human relationship. It hinted at a more direct connection between humanity and the celestial realm, bypassing the need for intermediaries. 2. Deep within the text lies the revelation of the Watchers, angelic beings who descend to Earth and share forbidden knowledge with humanity. The Book of Enoch's portrayal of the Watchers' rebellion challenged the Church's narrative of an obedient angelic hierarchy. The notion of angels acting against divine order and interacting with humanity on their own terms undercut the Church's efforts to enforce divine obedience and control. Three, the Book of Enoch unveils the Nephilim, beings born from the union of angels and mortals, posed a direct challenge to the Church's teachings on divine creation. Nephilim, I say, hey, I hope y'all paying attention and soaking this up now, man. Like I say, just a little something to make your mind wonder, that's all. And one more thing, if you're enjoying the video so far, don't forget to smash that like button right there. Just do me one favor, man, to show that y'all really rocking with me and rocking with the videos, man. Hit that like button. I appreciate it. Symbol of sin and corruption foreshadow the impending divine judgment. This judgment, as we shall see, is as awe-inspiring and terrifying as the giants themselves. The Book of Enoch transports us to celestial realms, a journey witnessed by Enoch himself. Imagine, if you will, taking a celestial tour through the multiple heavens, each more breathtaking than the last. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, was privileged enough to embark on this extraordinary journey. As he traversed these divine realms, he encountered beings of pure light and energy. Adam has fallen. And the children of men were multiplying. In those days, our daughters were beautiful. But the angels, the sons of God, they saw. And they were consumed with lust. One day, they decided that they wanted to come down to earth and to marry our women. They wanted to have children of their own. But Simyaza, the chief angel, the leader of the Watchers, he gets scared that he would get punished alone for this great sin. So those angels, they bound themselves together with a sacred oath. They swore they would never abandon this plan. Strayed from the Creator. See, they descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon, and they took unto themselves wives. Each chose for themselves one, and they began to defile themselves with them. These 
angels taught these women charms and enchantments. Magic. But when these women became pregnant, they bore the great giants. They consumed all our food, and it wasn't long until it was impossible to sustain them. And when our supply ran out, the giants turned against men. They devoured us like beasts. They sinned against our birds and beasts. The whole earth was corrupted. Eventually, one of those fallen angels named Azazel taught men about this substance called metal. It allowed us to make swords, knives, shields, and breastplates, and so much godlessness arose. The whole earth was filled with blood and injustice. So the archangels, Michael, Uriel, Raphael, and Gabriel, they saw the cries of earth who accused Semyaza for mingling with earthly women, leading to the birth of the great giants. Then the Creator, the Holy and Great One, spoke, and he sent the angel Uriel to the son of Lamech. He told him, Go to Noah and tell him to hide himself. Reveal to him the end that is approaching, that the whole earth is about to be destroyed, and a great flood is about to come. Tell him how he can escape, so his seed alone can be preserved. Man, doesn't this sound awfully a lot like the story of the Anunnaki? Is it me or am I just tripping, man? Let me know what y'all think about that damn blow. Then the creator spoke to the angel Raphael. Bind Azazel, hand and foot, and then make an opening in the desert and throw him inside. And then hurl jagged rocks upon him and cover him with darkness. Let him stay there forever. He will be cast into the fire on the day of judgment. You see, the whole earth was corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel. To him, ascribe all sin. Destroy the children of fornication and the children of the watchers. Turn them against one another so they may destroy each other in battle. They will not have a life. The Creator then said to Michael, Go, bind Semyaza and his associates who have defiled themselves with women. Let them witness the destruction of their children. Bind them for seventy generations, deep within the valleys of the earth, until the day of judgment. In those days, they will be led off into the abyss of fire, to be tormented forever and ever. Only then will the whole world be cleansed. One day, I, Enoch, was blessing the Lord of Majesty and the King of the Ages, until this holy angel called out to me and said, Enoch, go and tell the watchers who have left the high heaven that they brought a great destruction here on the earth, that they will not obtain peace nor forgiveness for them. Hey man, shout out to him. You know what I'm saying? He did his thing on that breakdown. I ain't gonna lie. Y'all gonna show this channel some love. Hey, and show all the other TikTok creators some love too, because I can do it without them just like I can do it without you. I appreciate y'all, man. For real, for real. Let's continue. This is the story of Adam. Created in 4004 BC, had two sons. Unfortunately, one killed the other. Had a third son at the age of 130 named Seth. He then had more sons and daughters, and her tradition says he had 56 children with Eve. Lemek, he spoke to for 56 years, who just happens to be Noah's dad. And then ultimately, Adam dies in 3074 B.C. Dang. All right, let's talk about the two Enochs. Now, Cain had a son named Enoch, but we're going to skip over to the one that Seth had. Seventh from Adam, there's Enoch. He is the man that never died. What does that mean? He was translated. He walked with God for 365 years, had sons and daughters, of which Methuselah, who was Noah's grandfather, lived to be 969 years old. 
But at the age of 365 years, because of his righteous character, okay, that's what got him in heaven. He never saw death. He was just snatched up right into heaven. And that's Enoch. He's mysterious, but very cool. Thanks for asking. See any land when we're looking down at the ocean from the space station? Why? Because you're over top of ocean. Okay, well, don't you think they could be fooling us with this picture? Okay, I give you this. I give you this. Wait, watch the picture. I know that I know. What do y'all think, man? Y'all think they be, they really be out of space and stuff? Y'all think they fooling us with this uh, CGI? Or what? Let me know what y'all Picture. Think. I know Watch that they the airbrushed some it's stuff. It's not up. airbrushed. This is us in our front yard on a solar panel, and we tricked you, showing you how easy. Ooh. We have zero budget. They have $65 million a day, and I tricked you. <laughs> Why you always lying? <laughs> It's definitely something. To me. This is a ball. This is a bigger ball. No difference. The geometric principles remain the same. No matter where you stand on a ball, your horizon line will always be below eye level. This fundamental fact with no exceptions. On a ball, your horizon is a fixed point below eye level. It cannot rise. The higher you go, the farther you see. But the higher you go, the lower your horizon must be. And it can be demonstrated all day alone. The math used to confirm the globe dimensions also confirms the expected horizon drop for Earth. So, when the math confirms what our common sense already tells us, and we see this at ground level, but we see this at 127,000 feet. Stay with me, people. This ain't rocket science. <laughs> this is a flat, extended surface. So is this. And this. And this. And this. He telling y'all, man, the earth is flat, man. Do y'all get it? He catch this drift yet? Yeah. He 
infinite last plane versus the low earth. Proof is in a pudding. in the comment section which one of you are flat around earth or let me know i must know i must know me i'm still trying to figure it out but from what i seen a while ago in some previous other clips hey i'm going toward the flat man let me know what y'all think we are not supposed to be calling upon the name god and i'm gonna show you so i'm reading from the book of enoch which was removed from our bibles this is referring to a type of angels and their names and the third was named Godriel, or shortened would be God. He it is who shown the children of men all the blows of death, and he led astray Eve. Now this is literally talking about Satan, the one who led astray Eve, right, in the garden. His true name is Godriel, which shortened would be God. Now if you go on Google and you type in God definition, you'll see this little name pop up next to it, G-A-D, God, the same way it's pronounced in Enoch, with that little vowel point above the A. Now look at this, Baal God means Lord of Fortune. Why do you think on the back of our money it says, in God we trust? It's not talking about the Most High of the Bible, it's a reference to Satan, the evil one. Now check this out, every time you see Baal in the scriptures, it actually is just the Hebrew word for Lord. So we're not supposed to be calling him Lord either. Alright, go into the Blue Letter Bible, click on Baal, and you will see it literally means Lord. Which is the name they planted over the name Yahuwah 7,000 times in the scriptures. Every time you see in all caps, THE LORD, it was originally his name, Yahuwah. If you don't believe me, go fact check me. I have studied to show myself approved, and I'm just revealing to you guys what I have found. Don't shoot the messenger. Now remember what I said, we're not supposed to be calling him Lord because it actually means Baal. Go to Jeremiah 23 verse 27, whose true name is Yermayahu, who attempt to cause my people to forget my name for Baal. Or Lord. Remember guys, Satan is literally the father of lies. Look at this. However, the word Baal means Lord. Look it up. Alright, a proper terminology would be Elohim or Elohim. It means mighty one. But we should really be calling upon his name. Now I can confidently say that the Most High knows our hearts. Alright, and he is abundant with grace and mercy. But now that you have this information, do your research on the name of Yahuwah and pray about it. Alright, don't treat this pearl like a swine. We all need to study to show thyself approved, right? That is a duty that we all have. So don't just push this aside and continue to say God. Go do some research and prayer. I'll see y'all in the next one. Don't forget to like and follow. Hey man, go show his channel some love, man. He always comes with some heat too, man. And I like how he did that. Uh, he not he not telling y'all that uh, God, Satan is God. He's saying that it's 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 been it's misleading that you know, like I said, man is touched it, it's tainted, man. They 
trying to flip it around. Remember, they said it's gonna they gonna try to make good seem evil and evil seem good, man. And they he just did the translation for you, man. Lord means ball and Gadriel God and there means God. I mean, dang, I don't know about the Gadriel being the devil or Satan. You know what I'm saying, Lucifer? Because I thought Lucifer was Satan. I think really, personally, that. You know, he's one of Satan's, you know, that's another name for Lucifer or something. I don't know. We got to do more research on that. But that's not what we're going to, you know what I'm saying, be distracted by right now. Y'all let me know what y'all think about that clip, though, man. Uh, we can't be misled no more. It's nobody else's fault but ours if we continue to be misled, man. And keep calling God and keep calling God real God and keep saying Lord and calling by our Lord instead of calling on our Father's name, His real name. You know what I'm saying? Yahuwah. I mean, they, they tell you, it just shows you they change His name and put their names there. So you be calling on them instead of our Father. You make perfect sense, man. They trying to mislead you. Let's get it, man. Let me know what y'all thinking, though, man. He tells Raphael to throw upon him pointed stones and to cover him in the darkness so that Azazel will remain there forever, devoid of all light. On the great day of judgment, God is set to task Raphael with casting Azazel into the fire. God tells Archangel Gabriel to destroy the Nephilim, the giants, or the offspring of the Watchers, by turning them against one another. He intends for them to perish by mutual slaughter. God finally tells Archangel Michael to confront the leader of the Watchers, Sunjaza, and to tell him that he and his allies, who had fornicated with the women, that they are polluted, and that their sons, whether their own angelic sons, or the sons they had fathered with the mortal women, will be slain before their eyes for seventy generations. Then, after witnessing the butchering of their offspring, they will be taken to the lower depths of hell, where they will meet fire and be locked away forever. By chapter 12, mm -hmm. we are told that Enoch was engaged by the Watchers and that they called him Enoch the Scribe. It appears that God tells Enoch to relay his message to the Watchers that they will never ever have peace as a result of what they have done. There seems to be an inconsistency here because Archangel Michael would have no doubt already done this as God had asked him to do so in the previous chapter. It could be that Enoch is told to do this so as to exemplify God's message, in that the Watchers are being told by both the Archangels who are above them and by the mortals who are beneath them. By having Enoch tell them their fate, it shows the Watchers that they are no longer above mankind in God's eyes, for they are being told their fate by a man, thus putting them on the same level and maybe even above them. In chapter 12, 5 through 7, he states, Then the Lord said to me, Enoch, scribe of righteousness, go tell the watchers of heaven, who have deserted the lofty sky and their holy everlasting station, who have been polluted with women, and have done as the sons of men do, by taking to themselves wives, and who have been greatly corrupted on earth, that on the earth they shall never obtain peace and remission of sin. For they shall not rejoice in their offspring, they shall behold the slaughter of their beloved, shall lament for the destruction of their sons, and shall petition forever, but shall not obtain mercy and peace. In chapter 13, it's interesting that Enoch only seems to confront Azazel, the apparent main culprit in all of this, despite the leader of the Watchers being Sunjaza. It's possible that while Sunjaza only sought to fornicate with the women and share some secrets of the heavens, he did not share the malice that Azazel did in teaching men about warfare. Notice, Azazel does not appear to take interest in the mortal women. The book of Enoch describes ten different levels of heaven. Enoch was taken to each heaven by an archangel, and Enoch witnessed what each level of heaven had housed. Some of the beings in the higher realms in heaven frightened Enoch so much that he fell down in terror. In this video, I will be explaining every level of heaven described in the book of Enoch. A quick disclaimer. My ultimate goal is to turn you all to the Most High. I do not want any of you praising angels or any other heavenly figure than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Alright, now that that's over, it's time to get into the ten levels of heaven. The beginning of two Enoch reads, There was a wise man and a great artisan whom the Lord took away. And he loved him so that he might see the highest realms, 
and of the most wise and great and inconceivable and unchanging kingdom of God Almighty, and of the most marvelous and glorious and shining and many-eyed station of the Lord's servants, and of the Lord's immovable throne, and of the ranks and organization of the bodiless armies, and of the indescribable composition of the multitude of elements, singing of the army of the cherubim, and of the light without measure, to be an eyewitness. This verse is explaining how the Lord viewed Enoch as such a great human that he took him to heaven while he was still alive. The only other person to go to heaven while they were still alive is the prophet Elijah. As we continue to go deeper into the book of Enoch, Enoch himself explains the encounter he had with the angels that took him to heaven. He details how he first had a dream about these beings coming into his room, and when he opened his eyes they were actually standing there. And I lay on my bed sleeping. And while I slept, a great distress entered my heart, and I was weeping with my eyes in a dream. And I could not figure out what this distress might be, nor what might be happening to me. Then two huge men appeared to me, the like of which I had never seen on earth. Their faces were like the shining sun, their eyes were like burning lamps. From their mouths, fire was coming forth. Their clothing was various singing, their wings were more glistening than gold. Their hands were whiter than snow, and they stood at the head of my bed and called me by my name. Then I awake from my sleep and saw those men standing in front of me in actuality. Then I bowed down to them, and I was terrified, and the appearance of my face was changed because of fear. Then those men said to me, Be brave, Enoch. In truth, do not fear. The eternal God has sent us to you, and behold... Man, I'm just gonna say, are y'all thinking these could be some sort of aliens, interstellar, uh, or interdimensional beings? What are y'all thinking these, uh, eight, these angels are? What are y'all thinking, man? I don't know, I man. I don't know, man. They sound like they could be some sort of aliens or something, man. Some type of beings, man. They sound like the good guys, but I don't know, man. Let me know what y'all think. Mm, right. The first heaven are, is directly yeah. above the firmament above the earth. The firmament is a dome-shaped structure that covers the earth according to the Bible. And we can also see this early depiction of the firmament in several ancient cultures, even the most advanced. Enoch describes seeing a huge body of water, far larger than any ocean on earth. God says in the Bible that there is water above the firmament. Genesis 1 verse 7 says, and God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Now let's take a look at how Enoch explains the first heaven in his own words. And they took me up onto their wings, and carried me up to the first heaven, and placed me on the clouds. And behold, they were moving. And there I perceived the air higher up, and higher still, I saw the ether. And they placed me on the first heaven, and they showed me a vast ocean, much bigger than the earthly ocean. Then Enoch goes on to explain seeing a mysterious group of figures known as the elders. Enoch also explains seeing 200 angels who govern the stars. Then Enoch describes the second heaven in a way that is eerily similar to hell, but for fallen angels known as the watchers. Enoch explains seeing a darkness greater than any earthy darkness. And he's seen prisoners in the second heaven awaiting judgment. He asks an angel why they were imprisoned, and the angel said this, I said to the men who were with me, Why are these ones being tormented unceasingly? Those men answered me, These are those who turned away from the Lord, who did not obey the Lord's commandments, but of their own will plotted together, and turned away with their prince, and with those who are under restraint in the fifth heaven. I will explain the emphasis on the fifth heaven when I describe that particular level, because it's a big part of the story. The third heaven Enoch saw was a heaven full of paradise for the righteous. The righteous people will inherit this heaven for their good deeds. However, there is also another side of this heaven very similar to hell. Let me describe what this heaven will look like in more depth, and also fill you in on who the righteous people are. Enoch 2 verse 8 goes on to say, And those men took me from there, and they brought me up to the third heaven, and set me down there. Then I looked downward, and I saw paradise. And that place is inconceivably pleasant. And I saw the trees in full flower, and their fruits were ripe and pleasant smelling, 
with every food and yield and giving off profusely a pleasant fragrance. And in the midst of them was the tree of life, at that place where the Lord takes a rest when he goes into paradise. And that tree is indescribable for pleasantness and fine fragrance, and more beautiful than any other created thing that exists. And from every direction it has an appearance which is good-looking and crimson, and with the form of fire. And it covers the whole of paradise. And it has something of every orchard tree, and of every fruit. And its root is in paradise at the exit that leads to the earth. And paradise is in between the corruptible and the incorruptible. And two streams come forth, one a source of honey and milk, and a source which produces oil and wine. And it is divided into four parts, and they go around with a quiet movement, and they come out into the paradise of Edom, between the corruptible and the incorruptible. And from there they pass along and divide. What do y'all think he means between the corruptible and the corruptible, corruptible and the uncorruptible? Let me know what y'all think. Into forty parts, and it proceeds in descent along the earth, and they have a revolution in their cycle, just like the other atmospheric elements. And there is no unfruitful tree there, and every tree is well fruited, and every place is blessed. And there are three hundred angels, very bright, who look after paradise. And with never ceasing voice and pleasant singing, they worship the Lord every day and hour. And I said, How very pleasant is this place! And those men said to me, This place, Enoch, has been prepared for the righteous. The righteous are described in verse nine as being those who suffer every kind of calamity in their life, and who afflict their souls, and who avert their eyes from injustice, and who carry out righteous judgment, and who give bread to the hungry. And who cover the naked with clothing, and who lift up the fallen, and who help the injured and the orphans, and who walk without a defect before the face of the Lord, and who worship Him only even for them, this place has been prepared as an eternal inheritance. Enoch was then taken to the northern region of this heaven, and he sees what he describes as a frightful place. This place is still located in the third heaven. However, on this side there is all kinds of torment going on. There is no light there, and Enoch emphasizes this mysterious black fire that blazes up. This is where I really made the connection to this potentially being hell. As Enoch is venturing through the northern region of the third heaven, he then notices a river of fire, and I couldn't help but to make the comparison to the Bible explaining hell to have a lake of fire. The angels told Enoch that this place is prepared for those who don't glorify God. More particularly, verse ten goes more into depth with exactly who will be here. The people doomed to inhabit this realm are those who practice on the earth the sin which is against nature, of witchcraft, enchantments, divinations, trafficking with demons, who boast about their evil deeds, stealing, lying, insulting, coveting, resentment, fornication, unaliving people, and who steal the souls of men secretly, seizing the poor by the throat. Taking away their possessions, enriching themselves from the possessions of others, defrauding them, who, when they are able to provide sustenance, bring about the death of the hungry by starvation, and when they are able to provide clothing, take away the last garment of the naked, who do not acknowledge their Creator, but bow down to idols which have no souls, which can neither see nor hear, vain gods, constructing images. And bowing down to vile things made by hands for all these, this place has been prepared as an eternal reward. Enoch is then taken to the fourth heaven. This is where the solar and lunar tracks are. I'll describe what this means in more detail. Verse eleven says, "And those men took me, and they carried me up to the fourth heaven, and they showed me there all the movements and sequences, and all the rays of solar and lunar light. And I measured their movements, and I compared their light." And I saw that the sun has a light seven times greater than the moon, and I saw his circle and his wheels on which he always goes, going past always like the wind with quite marvelous speed, and his coming and his return give him no rest day and night, and four great stars, each star having one thousand stars under it, on the right hand side of the sun's chariot, and four on the left hand side, each one having one thousand stars under it, altogether eight thousand. Going with the sun perpetually, and a hundred and fifty thousand angels accompany him in the daytime, and at night one. Well, guys, that was the book of Enoch. It's your boy Cozy.